And the June 13th meeting come to order. This is one the once a year or once uh, sometimes not even that often I get to open the meeting because we have a new chair uh, and it is my happy duty to introduce our the new 1995-96 uh, chair of the school board Beth Courier. So now this is all yours. Thank you Connie. Uh, the first thing on the agenda tonight is not on the agenda, but it will be, and it's a little presentation to our outgoing chairperson, to Ann Chapman, for her two years as um, chairman of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. She has served us very well, and I only hope I can do as good a job as she has. So, Ann, if you'd come up to the podium, we have a little something for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful, beautiful painting of Portland Headlight. Thank you very much. Has everybody seen this? I should have passed it down. Pass it down. Pass it down. It's beautiful. I, I, I'm not going to make a speech. We have a, a full agenda, but I've had a lot of fun serving as chairman, and I'm more than happy to turn it over to Beth, who is perfectly confident to do this job, and I look forward to serving under her. Thank you, Ann. Um, the first item on the agenda is adjustments to the agenda. Um, the only adjustment we're going to make is the public comment on item 9D, which is the nominations of co-curricular activities for 95, 96. We were going to move up to um, item number, after item number five, communications, since there are a number of people here who um, may want to speak on that, and it would keep it, you all here from um, having to wait through the entire meeting. Um, are there any other adjustments to the agenda? Charlie? Uh, under, the, under the finance subcommittee, we will need to do a, um, a vote on the setting the preschool or high school children's center tuition rate. Um, are there any other adjustments to the agenda? Seeing none, we will go on to the approval of the May 9th, 1995 school board minutes. Anne? I just had um, one comment just in the, uh, under item nine. It said that I seconded the motion to um, Let's see, to go into executive session, and I did not do do that. I don't know who did, and I'm not sure it really matters at this point. I can't remember who did. Charlie? <laughs> Charlie did. Thank you. Are there any other adjustments to the minutes? Seeing none. Um, do I ask for a motion to accept the minutes? <laughs> And the, you can just say the minutes stand approved. The minutes stand approved. The next item on the agenda is comments by the high school and middle school representatives. I'm not sure we would have any tonight. Mm, I don't think so. I wouldn't think so. The next item on the agenda is communications. Connie, do you have any communications? I defer to Ann Chapman, who has the only communication I have, and she said she'd like to explain it. Okay. Um, I gave uh, to, to everybody, Connie kindly made a copies for everybody of a packet of materials I received from Steve Conley, um, a teacher at the middle school, and six letters from students of his in the seventh and eighth grade, um, taking issue with a comment that I made at the last meeting about the last two weeks of school perhaps not being as full as they could be. Um, both Steve and, um, and these students um, you know, gave me a, a pretty good uh, rendition of what they do during the last two weeks. And all I can say is, um, well, first of all, their, their writing is very good. And um, second of all, it, it shows the, the great danger in making global comments. I do, um, I, I have written to Steve. I intend to write to, the, to each of the students who wrote to me. Um, I still do think that we have, have some issues to address in terms of 
um, you know, the last, last few weeks of school. Um, but obviously, um, a global comment like that was not terribly constructive, and I'm sorry if I caused anybody any pain with my comment. Thank you. Um, any other communications? Keith? Uh, just very quickly, I'd like to congratulate the members of the high school and middle school bands and choruses for their spring performances that they put on. They're really tremendous this year. I had the opportunity of attending all of them, and it was great to hear the, the groups perform. Great. Thank you. Charlie? I think at this time we should also congratulate both our girls, high school girls, um, tennis and boys tennis teams for winning their state championships and also our boys lacrosse team for winning the state championship for I believe the sixth time in a row. Great. Thank you, Charlie. Well, I have to add one thing. Gail? We have to commend the track team players that uh, made it to compete at the state level this year. They didn't come home with a championship. <laughs> Thank you. Any other communications? Seeing none, we will move on to um, any public comment that might, um, people might have on the co-curricular um, issues. Um, I just want to mention that if you come up to speak, we'd love to know your name and address, and to remind you that um, personnel issues are not open for public discussion, but the program and the future of the program are things that are um, wonderful to hear about, and if in the middle of uh, speaking we need to remind you about the personnel issues, we will let you know. Is there anybody here who would like to speak? Good evening. Uh, my name is Fran Haywood. I live at 1221 Shore Road, and I have a couple of, I hope, simple uh, requests. Uh, the parents uh, of the speech and debate students have been meeting recently, or have had a, a couple of meetings recently to talk about the program and uh, the proposed changes in the program and uh, some of the upset uh, surrounding all of that. Uh, one of the things that we uh, noticed was that, as far as we know, none of the members of the school board have direct involvement with or first-hand knowledge of the speech and debate program, have had any personal experience with uh, the, their sons and daughters in the speech and debate program. So one of the things that we thought would be beneficial is to meet with the school board members and any interested parent that has had involvement in, in the past or present uh, with the speech and debate program uh, to meet together those parents and all members of the school board in a workshop session or whatever you want to call it, in a session where, where you could further your knowledge about the speech and debate program and where people who have had firsthand uh, knowledge and experience with it would be able to share with you some of the things that they um, have experienced and some of the things that they hope for the future. Uh, that the speech and debate program will hold for their sons and daughters. So that's the first request, that you um, consent to meet with the parents of any of the parents in the speech and debate. And we would you know, like to have the date a, a couple of weeks anyway out so that we would be able to notify all the students that are presently involved and their parents by letter so that everybody feels that they have had you know, opportunity to be included because that's really what we would like to have. And that the second uh, request is that you defer voting on anything that would make any kind of a major change or any change in the speech and debate program as it now exists until after you have had the opportunity to uh, gain this knowledge that we feel that the parents can, um, can impart to you and uh, sort of further your understanding of what the program has meant for their sons and daughters and uh, the students, any students uh, that may care to share with you what the program has uh, been for them. So those two requests that we set a workshop date and secondly that you defer voting on uh, anything that would in any way uh, change the speech and debate program as it now exists. Um, I think we all know that not a lot happens uh, in the next month as far as planning for the fall, and it doesn't seem that there would be any disadvantage to giving parents the courtesy of hearing them before 
changes are uh, voted on and pretty much uh, etched in stone. Those two requests. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? My name is Erin McNally at 32 Ocean House Road. As co-captain of the speech and debate team, well not the debate team, but the speech team, um, I'd just like to say how, um, as the last um, parent just addressed, how the parents are pretty involved in it, but the students have had no voice in this situation. And i just like to point out that it is our program. Um, we all benefit from it greatly. Um, a lot of seniors have gotten a lot of help from Mr. Mullen from this program competing in speech and in certain events where, I mean, from getting a job in an interview or from what you decide to do after college. This is an extremely important program. And before you make any changes and vote on any changes, not only to tell the parents, but to get the students a voice in also. Because this is a very important program. As I said many times before, um, what, what it has done for me. Um, I did, I'm going to nationals this year. This is the first time I'm a junior. I'm going to be senior next year. Um, I'm number one in the state for humorous interpretation, number three in the state for impromptu. Um, and if you don't know what that means, humorous interpretation is you take a piece of work from any other author and you interpret humorously. There you go. So, um, and there's a lot of other, there's a lot of other categories, impromptu, um, original oratory, you write your own speech, okay? You write your own speech, speak it in front of judges and other peers who are competing against you, okay? Any speech. I wrote a speech freshman year, came in fifth in the state. It's about Malcolm X and equality. All right. Um, it, it really opens your mind. Um, it has to do with theater. It has to do with authentic voice. It has to do with reaching out to the people you're talking to to convince them, along with the debate. I mean, come on, how many senators, how many like representatives learn from that? I mean, I'm sure they maybe weren't part of it, but I have more points than Janet Reno does, okay? Right now in speech, Janet Reno. Okay, let's make a connection there, please. You know, um, not only that, uh, there's poetry, original works, prose, tons and tons of categories, where it gives the, the student an opportunity to be creative, an opportunity to be creatively and speak out creatively about what they believe in. You know, and I, I think it's really kind of inappropriate that the students haven't had enough voice in what you guys are deciding about. And I think before the program has changed, I don't even know what kind of changes you're doing, because we, we have no idea what's going on. You know, and that you might say is our fault, but in, a, in some sense, I think it's not. You know, um, it's our program, and maybe some other students might come up and tell you about it, but to be number one in the state, th that takes a lot, okay? That's waking up every Saturday. All right, getting on a bus at six in the morning and going to Bangor for the whole day competing, four rounds. You know, elimination at the States from 70 people down to six and then becoming one of those six people ranked in the state. You get points, all right, you learn a lot of stuff. You learn how to do research, you know, you, you learn how to do so much stuff that will, you will take through your life, all right? And you might not think that. I mean, you might just think it's some, you know, little program. But it's not, and it might not have a lot of people. But it's co-captain, that's what I'd like to say to you. And, you know, get the students involved. Have us be part of it. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Gail Atkins, and I live at 1189 Shore Road. Um, my son was involved in the speech program, and I was very pleased and proud that he was also asked to be one of two student speakers at his recent uh, high school graduation on Friday. I have had a number of people come up to me, um, both at graduation and even in the days following and today, and tell me what an excellent job he did and what a great public speaker he was. Um, I can only thank one person and one program 
for all of this, and that is Mr. Mullen and the speech program. Um, unlike some of the sports programs, which my son was also involved in, he was a captain of the swim team, um, kids tend to go out for sports and things. If you're not real good, it doesn't always make any difference because you're kind of part of a team and you can either blend in or in such a case of swimming, you're kind of, you know, competing on your own, but there's a bunch of other people in the pool too. Um, speech and debate, you're out there one-on-one. -on -one. You're standing there all alone, you're standing there in front of people, and you're putting yourself on the line, all alone. It is not easy for adults to do. It is certainly not easy for high school children to do when they're going through all the other pressures of just being in high school and self-conscious and, and changes and everything else. And this program needs the type of leadership that can get these kids involved, first of all. It's not as glamorous as a team sport. Um, as Aaron said, it's a lot of work a lot of hard work that a lot of people just don't really appreciate unless you have been involved in the program, had a child involved in it, and knows what goes into it. Um, it needs that kind of leadership. It needs that kind of guidance to get kids out of their classroom and get them involved in something like this. Um, because I don't think a lot, of, a lot of students will just voluntarily do it on their own. They need someone to get them involved. And the current leader of that program has been, I think, instrumental. I know he was instrumental in getting my son involved. Um, what Sam has learned in that program, um, as the previous speaker has said, will take him through his life. He will be an, able to handle a job interview with ease. He will be able to handle business pre presentations with ease because he has had these public speaking skills that he had, has learned from this program. Um, it's not just a little club. Uh, it is something that does give these students life skills. Um, it is very important to them. The leadership of this program is very important. Um, these kids have gone to states. They've gone to nationals year after year after year. I could easily, easily see this type of program, excuse me, <clears throat> program without the appropriate leadership just dying on the vine. Students not having as much interest. You need that enthusiasm. You need um, someone to just really get kids highly motivated to, to put themselves out on the line like that. And I just, for any of the board members that are not aware of, of the leader of this program, um, you know, I'm just here to say as a parent that it, he has done wonders for my son. I'm thrilled that he got my son involved. Um, and I hope that the program can continue to have that kind of leadership for all of uh, the students to come. And I wish he'd be around for my four and five year old. Um, but I'm sure retirement's in this picture someplace. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Uh, hello, my name is Douglas Cox, and I live at 1150 Shore Road. And uh, I have four children. <laughs> My oldest is uh, a junior, and I have two girls entering the freshman year next year from the middle school, and I have a six-year-old daughter. Um, my son, Paul, just completed his third year here. Uh, he's my stepson, and he uh, just distinguished himself uh, at the conclusion of his junior year with uh, wonderful awards that he earned on his own. Uh, I think he was awarded for advanced physics, computer science, advanced American history, Lincoln-Douglas debate, French five, Russia, uh, Chinese, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The fact of the matter is Paul attended a very distinguished private school in New York City before he came here. He made an adjustment his freshman year, adjusting to a smaller town, a smaller situation. It took him about a year. Um, but there was uh, the leadership of the speech department played an enormous part in helping this boy zero in on the goals that I was trying to uh, lay before him, what he had to accomplish in the next three years to be able to go forward into college and whatever he wanted to do after that. And uh, he heard it but from me, but he heard it resonate again from the leadership of the of the speech department. It was sort of the crown jewel of his three years of education. And uh, it just helped him enormously. And, uh, and he 
reflected on that and from time to time throughout the three years gave proper credit to that. He knew exactly what was inspiring him, what was making a difference in his life, what was giving him self-esteem, what was challenging him in so many ways. It was just, uh, he was so fortunate to have this program available to him. And uh, I think we have something that is probably the envy of most school systems in the country. And sometimes we take for granted the things that we have. And uh, this leadership and those people who create things, those people who sweat over a program, they leave their mark and they bring something very distinctive to uh, whatever they bring to a level of excellence. We have individuals who are doing that right now. I don't want to see that lost when those people are still available to us, when they want to continue. Uh, and uh, whatever accommodations and idiosyncrasies that life brings, nothing is easy, but I'm sure that we can accommodate excellence. I think this is a, this program represents something that uh, speaks to intellectualism in our school system that as a community we can be extraordinarily proud of. And it's not a program that just serves, and I don't think, just a few people. I think there are 60 students who are involved in this. I don't know what a basketball team has for kids or how many kids are in a soccer team or how many kids are in anything else. And I would like to see athlete, scholar, combinations be the things that we're proud of. And uh, I would just ask that no unilateral decisions be made and that uh, we have a chance on a one-on-one -on -one intimate setting, uh, be able to sit down and talk about not just individuals and leadership, but the whole program and, and the consequences of this program for our young people. Because we have, uh, I don't want to see the baby go out with the bathwater. Um, let's pause, think about it thoughtfully, have a, an honest dialogue among the parents and uh, those of you who are charged with bringing this program into the future and um, do something, you know, just have a constructive conversation on it so that we can, can all be heard. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Is there somebody else? Anybody? Anybody else want to speak on the issue? Thank you. Um, we will then move on to the superintendent's report. Thank you. And uh, I believe we have, is Kelly? Where is Kelly? Uh, Kelly isn't here this evening. She, she uh, apparently is no oversight on my part. I did not realize that we were expecting Kelly and she to be here. Oh, OK. Well, then I'll, I'll give her a report for her. Okay. Unfortunately, I can't give it with the same kind of uh, uh, flare because uh, the report that the board has in their packet is a summary from Kelly Hassan and Lisa Martin who were representatives of the school district at the International Reading Association Convention. Uh, and as part of the um, purpose behind this, we asked to make sure that there was a report. Um, and I remember having a conversation with them back along where they were expecting to be here with perhaps some slides and so forth, but uh, I think they expected it perhaps in May. At any rate, just to summarize quickly, this was a large um, conference convention, uh, not just a place where you go to look at new wares and chit chat. It is uh, basically a seminar with many different papers being delivered uh, from university as well as uh, public school people. Um, and in fact, our people were invited to join a panel on some of the difficulties that districts have had who have tried to use whole language and blend it in with statistics, uh, with uh, structural approaches to reading. Uh, their comments range from uh, telling you a little bit about assessment uh, procedures that they saw, including, of course, portfolio approaches, talking about some of the technology, um, there, I think the comments they make about uh, elementary teachers recognizing the need for reflective practice that is not only thinking about what children are doing but their own learning as well are very important. And I think they also make some comments about uh, presentations on phonics and spelling as well as the uh, more whole language approaches so you can see that this was a well-balanced discussion. Um, since much of this is explained here unless you had some question. I know I've talked to the 
teachers involved and they were extremely enthusiastic and I think in their notes to you recommend that we make a practice of sending people to such conferences they were invited um, and I would certainly hope that uh, there might be one a little closer to home next year so that we could actually take advantage of that. Any question? Comment? Carla? Is this particular conference that they went to an annual one that's basically yes. the si it's a, it's a specific conference that occurs? Yes, on, and it's, reading is of course a broad issue that um, not only is it um, clearly an issue to every single public school but it's also an issue at the university level, and so this is one that actually br brings the two worlds together. And this one was um, teachers are invited to participate. Yes. I, I would just like to comment that I do think um, that when we send, uh, send people to a conference of this magnitude, um, it is a su substantial financial um, commitment by the district that it would be good to have the teachers here. I understand there was some kind of misunderstanding, but to explain to us and to the public, um, you know, what what we were spending the money for. Um, I think they'll be happy to do that um, at the beginning of the year. Uh, have oh, no Kelly's doubt that they be have gone money. Now. Kelly, yes, will be, Kelly will be in. Oh, she'll be she'll be back visiting, and we'll actually we'll we'll find time for that, I'm sure. I, I, and I also think that we need to have um, some follow-up on what what came of it. And I, I know she said she's talked to the colleague, to her colleagues and there some suggestions of, of mm -hmm. things to do. But it'd be good to just continually be updated on the results of that. I really must take full responsibility for that. Uh, both Kelly and uh, Lisa spoke with me yesterday and I had not updated with Connie so it absolutely was a communication glitch. They were both prepared to be here, and so on their behalf, I would extend the, the offer to come again, because they were very, very clear on their recommendations and wanted to be sure that we all um, had an opportunity to hear them and to hear them firsthand. So I, we can certainly clear that up. And I want to address the issue of sharing with colleagues. They shared formally in full faculty meeting uh, for about half an hour on the, work, the, the last workshop day, addressed issues, presented every um, possible aspect of what they had attended in California, and brought that back to people as well as shared all the uh, handouts that they acquired and held individual sessions with grade levels. So I wanted to be sure you knew that it was well, well explained and shared with, within the Pond Cove team. I just wanted to make one comment. Also, they talked a little bit about com becoming part of the internet, um, that they learned about that or that was part of it, and it would be wonderful if that could be shared with maybe the technology committee and what they saw. Okay, moving on. In your package, you have a list of the uh, assignments on school board committee, uh, committees, some of them uh, not so much committees as represent representatives to various uh, groups. Um, do you think would you want us just want to just read them down? <laughs> okay. Uh, perhaps this is also a time to review for um, anybody who happens to be interested what the structure of school board work is. That is, we have two standing subcommittees. The finance subcommittee, which regularly meets at 6.30 an hour before school starts where warrants are signed, um, where the business manager reviews any unusual uh, issues that have come up during the month. And uh, it's, it's also an opportunity for us to talk about um, upcoming financial issues or problems that need to be ironed out of one kind or another, some of which come to the full meeting. Some of them simply are informational at that time. Uh, by the way, any subcommittee meeting is open to the public. Uh, we do at the end of each meeting, um, both on our written agenda and also uh, orally, uh, make sure that there is public notice of any of these meetings. Uh, for this year, the finance subcommittee is Charlie Greer Chair, uh, Priscilla Armstrong and Keith Witherell. Our second standing subcommittee is the policy subcommittee. Um, this usually meets, has been meeting at least, um, once a month and during the day, making it perhaps more difficult for people to attend if they have some interest. But um, the policy subcommittee is an important place for uh, the board to 
look at rough language, uh, refine it, bring people in to discuss and to give background information, and to submit policies to the full board for approval. Neither of these groups um, makes uh, actions on the, takes actions on their own. If there are actions that need to be taken, they're all referred back to the Committee of the Whole. These are discussion uh, and working groups. For this upcoming year, the chair of the policy subcommittee will be Ann Chapman with Carla Bernstein and Gail Dransfield uh, continuing uh, serving on that committee. Then there's a long list of uh, committees or groups that individual board members um, represent. The, uh, board as a whole and uh, this kind of thing for instance with either out of the district or with issues that uh, teachers and administration are working on as a liaison between the board and um, the staff. Uh, we have a really a newly formed committee uh, headed by Carla Bernstein and Keith Witherell on the Arts Committee. We discussed that at our last meeting trying to pull together um, a vision for ultimately K-12. Um, then we have actually two standing committees that are uh, only meet by contract once a year, although they may have to have more than one meeting a year. Uh, there's language in the teacher's contract that covers both of these committees and the people who serve on them. The school board representative for the athletic fee committee will be Beth Courier for this year, and the school board representative for the co-curricular fee committee will be Priscilla Armstrong. Um, the building committee, which will get dissolved this year, that will actually, we hope, <laughs> better, <laughs> better. <laughs> will continue to be Ann Chapman and Charlie Greer. Um, and each year we have a calendar committee with Carla Bernstein chair this year, <coughs> also Ann Chapman and Beth Courier serving on that. Um, we have had a school board liaison to the community coalition this year, that's Keith Witherell. Um, there's a legislative liaison contact person that is sort of the person who receives information directly from the school board's association on legislative issues. That's Gail Dransfield. And Charlie Greer will continue as the main school board association's delegate. That is, they have a congress once a year, and he is uh, our representative to that body. Um, school board members serve on all of the negotiations with their five units and uh, take turns. The appointments will come up as those become operative. Um, we have a school board member uh, serve as an advisor on the PRVTC General Advisory Board. This year that will be Charlie Greer. Um, we are certainly trying to uh, work on a systemic vision for science. And this year that will be, the school board rep will be Gail Dransfield. Um, our new teacher contract has some language for a staff development committee, and uh, the school board representatives will be Ann Chapman and Beth Courier, and continuing systemic K-12 technology committee, Keith Witherell and Charlie Greer will continue with that. In addition to those particular assignments, school board members do attend many ad hoc meetings of one kind or another. It is our intention to make sure that they are involved and um, Many times, of course, parents are invited and attend and participate in these committees as well. Did I list, miss anything? I don't think so. I'm moving on. So Weatherby, as I speak, is packing or doing something over in the buildings, and she's given me a um, summary of what the update on construction project, and I will try to just go through this quickly and then answer any questions that I can. Right now, as of today, we are exiting the buildings. The 1930s building is empty and frankly under demolition. And that doesn't mean it's being destroyed. It means that demolition means that all the interior partitions that are so that we can get at the plumbing and the electricity and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> doesn't take long to demo. It takes a lot longer to build it back up again. Uh, the middle school administrative wing, the, the old one, is now empty. Administration at the middle school has moved into the new, uh, their new quarters. The second floor D wing, that is the two-story wing, uh, two-story building at the end of the middle school complex. Uh, the eighth grade area is now empty. Uh, the locker room and gym are empty, and 75% of the portables are now empty. And the first floor D, um, seventh grade area half done. 
D-Wing, in case any of you are, I'm sure all the board and probably most of the parents are aware, it's going to be demolished. If you have any sentimental feelings about D-Wing, you want to go out and take a picture of it. Um, that the part of the middle school that was built as a high school extension, um, if I remember correctly, 1960. Uh, when we were doing the analysis for renovating the building, we discovered that it was going to cost within two to three hundred thousand dollars of what new area construction would cost us to bring that particular piece of the building in line. The architects came up with a plan that replaced that square footage in a far more cohesive fashion, and as you will see when the middle school is open, and um, by uh, demo, demo, what's the word? Demolishing. Demolishing. Thank you. I was going to say demolitioning. I, no, that's not, not a word. Um, we then have sufficient parking to maintain both schools, so that was all part of the original plan. Uh, <clears throat> we have thought perhaps of having a fundraiser by asking current and former students if they'd like to have five minutes on the bulldozer, but <laughs> <laughs> I haven't figured out a way of selling those tickets, so. Besides, Sue has got about five different things tagged here. Everybody has to stay off the area. It's truly important that everybody stays away from this construction site. It really is very busy, lots of stuff going on, and one of the things that we are concerned about is that um, we're right in the middle of, of the action and kids are around. Um, it's not uncommon for those of us who check the buildings on weekends to see kids on bicycles kind of floating by. Uh, so anybody here or anybody watching this, if you have children, whether they are little ones or, or teenagers, please, please ask them to stay off the site. I'll have more to say about that at the end of this report. What is left to be emptied is a media center, computer room, um, the other half of the seventh grade, one portable, and everything will be out of middle school by noon on Wednesday. When we say everything out, obviously um, some of these spaces will be rehabbed and people will be moving back in, but all textbooks, all materials, all desks, all movable equipment has to be out of those rooms. Uh, we went through this last year. In fact, we've gone through it five or six times in various parts of the building. Uh, the trailers that are in back of the high school that are on site in various parts of the construction site, um, we've had to box things up, label them, put them away so they can be uh, unpacked again at the end of the summer. Uh, it really is a lot of work, and I credit all the staff, certainly um, our custodial staff and certainly Sue Weatherby and her people for keeping this thing organized. Um, I guess that pretty much, all right, looking ahead. Week of June 26, area A at Pond Cove will be punched out. Well, that means we have a punch list. You know, when you get through, you go, you walk through, and if you only have 150 things that still need to be done, you're lucky. Um, the fourth grade will be moved into that area. Week of July 1st, third grades will be moved from the portables to area B, and the week of June 19th, the cafeteria uh, carpets will be installed. Um, so that leads me to the last piece here. <clears throat> the construction site, all the construction site over there, uh, that means middle school uh, and the, um, we can get into Pond Cove. Pond Cove is accessible to us and the administration part of the middle school is also accessible. But here's how you get to it. No foot traffic, no bicycles, and no vehicles on the middle school site stay away from the middle school site because there's really going to be a whole lot of stuff going on. In fact, do not use the new Pond Cove Middle School Access Road. Do not use that. Do not use that parking lot. Anybody who is visiting or staff of Pond Cove or Middle School are asked to park down at the high school. Uh, I guess you could use, you know, the bus lot too as far as that goes, but the student parking lot um, that we, we put in place last year and walk up. Um, park at the high school student lot below Holman Field and enter Pond Cove and Middle School through Lower C. That's what used to be the lot building. That's called Lower C. And that door at the end, which is right by the turnaround where the buses come in, that's a place to enter Pond Cove right there. Uh, parking for the athletic fields should be in the high school student lot or by the tennis courts. 
<laughs> I, if I give you a test. Um, the, I think the bottom line on this is that um, we are still a long way from completion of this project. We have had a number of discussions about the, um, the way in which this timeline has been moved up, accelerated. Uh, what they are now going to do is to proceed with the demolition of the D-Wing, to move the portables that we use for student classrooms uh, off-site, to work on the uh, uh, rest of the parking lot and the seating, uh, all the leveling that has to go on when they move off the, uh, the uh, town portables. All of that has to happen and all of the construction has to finish and we want to open school by September 5th. So the place will be crawling with construction pieces of equipment and with people. There will be fences up. There will be people out there telling people to stay off. But we really, really want to impress people how important it is to stay out of there. So if you have business at, the, at Pond <coughs> Cove or uh, at the administration offices of the middle school, please park down here at the high school. And if there's room available, at the parking lot with the buses and walk up. And I'm afraid that's the best we can do for the summer, but it's for everybody's safety. Any questions on that? Comments? Carla? Carla? I don't know if you'll be able to answer this. Um, the middle school playground gets a lot of heavy use in the summertime. And I know it's got the huge dirt piles there and a lot of construction around it. And they had those orange webbing fences, which continually get trampled. Yeah. Um, are we going to make that playground off limits this summer? Or are we going to improve the fencing around it? or? Well, it's a good question, and I can't answer it completely. I've been uncomfortable having that accessible all year long, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what we can do <laughs> to keep people out of there. Um, I would certainly urge people to have second thoughts about, you know, if they're standing right there and the kids are using the equipment, excuse me, using the, um, you know, the, the playground equipment, um, I suppose, Okay, but I think that they'd be wise to go use the other one. I have a question mm -hmm. too. Do you know if there's any sign or blockage of the new road going in so that people will not go in that way? Okay, I don't know, but I suspect that uh, they have to use it for trucks, but I don't honestly know the answer. That. I'll ask about them. Is the new um, community basketball court open for use this summer? And then they would have to walk in through that way and that would be another question for mm -hmm, Sue. Okay. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else? Mm -hmm. Can we be notified when the demolition of D is going to take place? Okay. Why, you want to be there, Charlie? You sure do. <laughs> <laughs> I was there when the roof came off, so I want to be there when the building comes down. <laughs> Okay. Uh, and, um. I just also want to thank Sue for all of her hard work. I know that this has been a huge project to undertake, and she has done a wonderful job. It is enormously complicated. And I also want to thank the staff. They've been terrific about all of this. It's, um, and parents and kids. They've been going to school in, uh, particularly, I think, as the Pond Cove has started to look much nicer, and the middle school looks much worse. Mm -hmm. um, it really does look like a bombed out structure. So better times are coming. OK, anything else? Thank you. Okay, fine. And just a quick notification uh, uh, update that we did, in fact, uh, we have uh, volunteers to serve on that professional development committee that is part of the language of our new contract. Um, and we will be organizing during the summer. And that's it for me. Thank you, Connie. Uh, the next item on the agenda is school board subcommittees and reports. Finance Committee. Uh, the Finance Committee met this evening at 6.30 in the Chamber Conference Room. And for those of you who do not know what the Chamber Conference Room is, the room right behind the chamber here. Um, we signed the warrants. Uh, there was discussion about setting preschool tuition rates for the high school children's center for next year. We will have a vote action on that shortly. Um, the technology committee submitted to the uh, finance committee a proposal for computer lease purchase uh, options for upgrading and, and 
and fulfilling some of the some of the recommendations of the technology committee, um, which will yield us about 50 to 60 new computers next year. Um, we discuss some possible um, suggested budget reductions if, if for some reason our uh, state subsidy should come in less than what we've anticipated. Um, we looked at recent state subsidy comparisons, which could give us anywhere from 58,000 to the plus to anywhere to 140,000 to the negative. So they're all over the place. Um, there doesn't seem to be any um, closure on that issue yet. Um, I would like to move that we set the tuition rates for the two-day program in the high school children's center from $100 to $105 per month, that we set the three-day program from $135 to $145 for the, for the academic year in 95-96. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Charlie? The reason for the increase is to, to essentially meet the costs of this uh, curriculum program, which is a high school curriculum program. Um, that is why we are increasing the rate of $5 for the two-day program and $10 for the three-day program. Um, this year, we did end the year in a negative balance. Any other comments? All those in favor? 7-0. And that is the Finance Committee report. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, school Building Committee, I think, Connie? Okay. Uh, we met actually um, in Pond Cove. I had a tour of the building and um, took advantage of the fact that uh, the, I'm not sure whether, I guess we're calling it the atrium. I think of it as a lobby, but it really is kind of the atrium, the open space outside the um, administrative offices. Uh, we're finding that that really is a nice space, what the architect originally called a knuckle, if you will recall because it joins the two levels and uh, is a little wider space than she would have liked originally, but we're finding that it has lots of good, good uses. Um, a principal item of discussion at the uh, meeting was trying to project where we were on our contingency. As we get into the demolition, particularly the 30s building, there are a lot of concerns, just exactly what are we going to find behind the walls. Um, in addition, there was some discussion about uh, the fact that at the present time the contingency was pretty healthy. Uh, we had some question raised about whether any of the alternates um, that had been rejected originally because we didn't have enough money to cover them, should we start looking at those and seeing if there was something that could be covered. Uh, however, the architects also called our attention to a problem that is undoubtedly going to be more expensive than they originally thought, which is the uh, lateral bracing problem in the middle school gym. We had been made aware of that um, years ago when we did the structural analysis following um, uh, the roof incident that, that Charlie's already mentioned. Um, and as they have analyzed how to take care of that, they are finding some um, problems they weren't immediately aware of. The contingi contingency should cover it. But what that discussion certainly uh, convinced all of us is there's no point in looking for um, adding alternates that we originally didn't have. We will be moving ahead with our goal of having a safe, sound structure, but it will not have some of the additional issues. That was a major thrust of that conversation. We obviously talked about some of the routine um, progress reports, but that was a big issue. Any questions? No. Thank you, Connie. Policy subcommittee. Um, as the outgoing chair, I will give the last report on the policy subcommittee. We met on Tuesday, June 30th. We discussed the community services fee structure, which we will present tonight under uh, first reading. We discussed athletic field trips, which you will also see there. And the next meeting will be set by the new chair, Ann Chapman. Technology. Oh. I'd just like to compliment the policy subcommittee this year with, it, with the chair, Beth Currier. Um, I think we've had as a goal for, I think it's three years, but it might be all four of the years that I've been helping the board set goals, 
to finish the policy manual. I think we've finally just about done it. Um, that means by finishing doesn't mean that we're all done with policies. It just means that we are actually through checking all the policies that we have. It just wasn't much more complicated than it looked initially, and you've kept us on task. Thank you. Thank you. Technology Steering Committee, Charlie? Uh, the Technology Steering Committee met on June 5th uh, in the high school. Um, we, our agenda included the staff purchase plan and nine people showed interest from the staff to purchase computers through a, a um, purchase option uh, payroll deduction plan. Um, the system-wide hardware standards were set. Um, we will be, any, com any hardware purchases that we make will contain a RISC processor chip, an 8 megabyte, megabyte RAM, 500 megabyte hard drive, CD-ROM drive. These are minimum system equivalent to the PowerMac 5200-75LC. Um, um, an IBM compatible to include the same RAM and HD with Pentium chip. This, this is the minimum um, hardware um, standard that we will use in purchasing any computers. Um, the purchases for next year under our technology plan were brought forward and, brought and forwarded on to the finance subcommittee. Um, the chairman, Gary Lenoy, will work with the business manager in working out some kind of lease plan with our attorney and whatever company we do end up leasing from, it probably will be Apple Computer. Um, we reviewed three bids for a maintenance plan uh, for our computer systems um, and decided on, on one, which will give us at least two hours every other week of someone here on campus to do any repairs or or upgrades or anything that needs to be done. Um, we also talked about agenda items for next year, starting in the fall. Again, some of that is staff development, uh, the continued courses that have been offered for our staff. Um, we also, in looking at the number of people that responded to the staff purchase plan, need to survey staff and student level of expertise and those who have computers currently to have some handle on, on what, is, what is going on in our system. Um, and we also need to look at some software issues and um, we would form a committee in the fall to, to look at those. And again, to look at some how we release in-house resource staff to work on computer, um, computer system and computer um, curriculum. Thank you, Charlie. Any questions? Ann? I just have a comment. I think it's going to be um, quite important that the staff development committee have some kind of interface with the technology committee because obviously we have a lot of staff development needs in that regard and maybe we could set up some joint meeting at some point to talk about how we can accommodate their particular needs with, within those days, those staff development days we're at. Great, thank you. Any other comments, questions? The next item on the agenda is unfinished business, calendar for the 95-96 school year. Connie, do you want to? Sure. Anything? Well, the um, two issues I think have been changed since May. Um, one, we has, have a, a, an agreement with the Teachers uh, Association that adds two days to the school year. Those two days will be used for um, teacher staff development. Uh, and I think it's really important that we've been able to take that step. It's so clear that we don't have enough time to plan, um, certainly systemically, at a time we can get teachers together. So I think that uh, it's really good that we've been able to make that move. Uh, the other change, I believe the calendar you saw in May, uh, sometimes these things go through so many revisions I sort of forget exactly which one, but I've, I'm pretty sure the May one, 
we were still talking about starting school for faculty before Labor Day. Um, after really reviewing the construction timeline, uh, we've decided that we really need that Labor Day weekend. I'm sure that we will be doing a lot of scrambling around. Uh, so we're going to start school on Tuesday, September 5th, as a faculty day. And for any parent listening, uh, that means that Wednesday, September 6th, is the first student day. Obviously, this has the effect, along with adding two staff days, of uh, making June uh, a longer period. That is, graduation and the last day of school certainly will be a lot later than it was this year. And if we have snow days on top of that, I guess we'll just dust off the 4th of July units. But um, of course, I'm a believer in year-round schooling anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I get one way or the other. Uh, before anybody gets too upset, we only have 182 days in the calendar. That's where they fall is where they fall. Um, there are, uh, there. I, I think those are the pertinent issues. You really have to have the calendar in front of you to be talking about when those staff development days fall and so forth. There are also notations on the calendar about um, the quarters and trimesters um, as normal. Okay. I had a couple of questions. Sure. Um, on uh, October 27th, it's teacher workshop day is mm -hmm. noted. Is that for all classes including high school? Yeah. Yeah, that's the conference. It is used for conference by both the uh, Pine Cove and Middle School and some use at the high school. I'm not sure how absolutely universal it is. It's on a different footing from the elementary, but certainly is used for some conferences. And, and then the half day the day before is a half day for the high school also? Yes. Oh, okay. And then in June on graduation, even though we're starting on September 6th, graduation is um, down for June 7th. Is that week after then that everyone attends, not including the seniors, Yes. Okay. And so that would be exam week, presumably, yes. for the rest of the class? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm a little concerned about that one, because if we have snow days, we're, we're sort of uh, definitely in trouble. Um, how locked in at this point are we to graduation on the 7th? Um, it's primarily locked in with, with other uh, issues concerning project where graduation. Yeah. less than that of normal mm -hmm. of underclassmen. And I, I mm -hmm. took that assumption that um, seniors would not, are not required to be in schools um, as many days. Mm -hmm. Well, um, certainly we should have some time to make those adjustments, should we? But that's what the intention is now. Thank you. I'd just like to comment. It does seem a little early um, to be having the graduation on the 7th. But let's look at it. Was the 9th? Can I just ask, is, do we have a seventh down there just because it's nice if it's a Friday? It, it does, it just seems kind of risky to me, you know, for the reasons Connie said, and I also feel pretty squeamish about the idea of lopping off a week of school, but that's me. Um, is it a little, a little risky? Which would make it the last day of school if we didn't have any snow days. Yeah, that's tough. It was the ninth this year. It's just two days earlier. No, it, it's, it's not the actual date that bothers me. It's that it's a week before. And then if there's snow days, which they're likely to be, you know, at least a couple. I don't think we've ever not had a couple. You're really lopping off that year. And I'm wondering if it's just because Friday's much nicer mm -hmm. for convenience of families. I mean, every, other places have graduations all different days. I think Portland was Monday. yesterday and on the weekend, and I'm just wondering. I would think that. I don't want to make a big deal about no, it. No, I think part of the consideration on Friday is for families that, <clears throat> that are traveling from, from, from distances. They're here for Friday and the weekend to travel back. Um, it has been traditionally been Friday. We did have one Saturday graduation last year. Um, so uh, again, what, what, what had happened is looking at 
about three months ago before we talked about the schedule, looking at where we graduated this year and assuming school would start relative, relatively in the same, around the same time period that the seventh coincided with that same weekend. So thus the seventh, because it's a leap year next year, um, it, it, um, it's the seventh instead of the ninth. Or, and uh, I can definitely look back and, and change that if, if you'd wish. I think if you put it in the middle of the week or a Monday, uh, it may affect parent, again, families who travel uh, for high school graduations, but that's something that the board can, can consider and get back to me at. I mean, we don't, it's not necessary to make a decision tonight, but okay. we should probably make a decision relatively soon so that I can make arrangements for things like project graduation and banquet reservations, things which we do usually a year in advance. We've already booked uh, project graduation for next year because schools fill it up uh, as soon as uh, the next year starts. So. I can work on that. I, I personally would feel a lot more comfortable even if it was moved to the 14th because I think it's extremely likely we're going into the next week in any case. I mean, if having it on the weekend for those reasons makes it more desirable, um, that, that would be my call at this point. Of course, no one has a crystal ball to know. It'd probably be the one year when there were no <laughs> snow days, but. It's probably unlikely. I'd be more comfortable moving it to the 14th also. Other board members have feelings? I think the um, uninterrupted week afterwards for exams is um, easier on the underclassmen than the way it was this year with the Wednesday starting the exams and going over the weekend of graduation to the Monday. So I like the 7th. Carla? If, um, Rick, if we did move it to the 14th and the rest of the school is having an exam week, what are the seniors? They the would seniors, be taking they, exams also. They take also. their exams the same week that everyone else right. takes their exams. So their exams wouldn't be done till graduation day. Day before, yeah. Mm. What we could possibly do is move exams a couple of days for, under, for the uh, seniors so that they would be done maybe on Wednesday of that week and have it through, as we have done this year. We were flexible with the exam schedule, I think, more so than the date of graduation, if, you, if we set that. And what are the implications if graduation did turn out to be the last day of school? If there were no snow days, is that anything that's logistically more difficult? I have some upset seniors, but other than that, <laughs> <laughs> they like the idea of having a week before three or four days. It has been traditionally that we finished before, but it ranges from three to five days, not necessarily a week in advance. Um, so, again, my anticipation was we would start school relatively about the same time and, and end it on the same weekend. There are actually systems that the seniors don't take final exams. Okay. You're not suggesting. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm making you aware there are systems locally who, where the seniors do not take final exams. That's not to emulate, though. No. <laughs> I, th I think it, it, it puts a big strain on the staff by putting graduation the last day of school. To, you know. It really does. There are a lot of things that are going on for seniors alone right. and staff that are involved in putting that together. The preparation of it, attending the senior banquets and award nights, uh, as well as getting ready for exams and correcting exams for report cards. Like one of the things we do, we, uh, we have to know senior grades, obviously, that Thursday. That's, so that teachers actually have one day between the end of the final exam until uh, graduation to get all grades in so that we know if seniors, if there are any seniors who may not be graduating and the grades are all taken care of. That's a good, I, so I'm, I'm with Gail. I have no problem as long as we're meeting the state requirement for the number of days they have seniors have to be in school. Believe me, the seniors will not mind. Yeah, no, I, no, I, I think I, it sends a bad, uh, I don't know. That's just. I'm assuming there would be snow days so that it wouldn't. I understand be, that. Yeah, yeah. I, understand. I agree too. I think it, it, we should keep it on the 7th. Seems to make sense. I'm for the 7th. And this being my first year of ever having a senior, I'll tell you, it's even hard on families. <laughs> <laughs> well, why don't we leave it the seventh on this calendar and we can maybe discuss it a little more. Yeah, we, we certainly can do that. In the meantime, I can, I can check and see if there are dates available for these other facilities that we rely on to, as part of the graduation uh, ceremony with project graduation and banquet situations too. Thank you. 
entertain a motion. I move that we ex accept the school calendar for 1995-1996 as presented. Second. Second. Yeah. Any discussion? All those, oh, Charlie? This is a much nicer process than we went through last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We do learn. <laughs> any, any other comments? No. <laughs> All those in favor? Seven zero. <laughs> well, the next item on the agenda is policy second reading. Um, being the outgoing policy chair, I can talk about that a little bit. It's um, file INDB flag displays. Um, we discussed it last time. It is main law that a school, a U.S. flag be displayed in every school unit, every school day, and on appropriate occasions and in every classroom, in every school, public school in the unit. And I know that the administrators were going to check on that and get back to us. Um. Yes, we, we do have the flags in the high school. Um, we are certainly making provisions for, uh, in our newly renovated classrooms, um, to have flags and brackets. We discovered that, you know, that was also something to be concerned about. Um, at our last uh, board meeting, not only did we discuss this, but we also raised, ra the issue was raised about um, Pledge of Allegiance uh, and so forth. Uh, we've had administratively, we've discussed that issue and agree with you that this is part of the curriculum and does need to have a regular procedure. So we don't have one to present you tonight, but we've had discussions about over the intercom, different classes taking turns or various procedures um, so that we can be much more consistent about it. Um, we will give you that procedure before school starts. Ann? I, I think that's great. I, I got a lot of comments um, from people and I think we all got one letter at least um, about that. And I do think it is important. It should be part of the curriculum. And I think the idea of having a student every day um, doing it over the intercom would be great. I think the kids would enjoy it and would yeah. make it not so routine. Well, I, I'm not positive that that will be what will happen. It might be teachers, but at any rate, we will give you that routine before the, the procedure before school starts. Charlie? Even some of our functions now are starting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. And we might, as a, as a body, the set same. the precedent as does the town council. Yep. Okay. Other comments? I'll entertain a motion. I move that we accept uh, policy file INDB flag displays as presented. I second that. Any discussion? All those in favor? Seven zero. Uh, next item on the agenda is possible adjustments to fiscal year 96 budget, Connie. Well, as we noted in the report from the Finance Subcommittee that, um, you know, who knows? If you got a dartboard, I guess that's that it. We may receive more money than we've estimated in our budget for subsidy, or we may receive less. Um, the worst case scenario has been uh, 140000 from our budget. Had some preliminary discussions with the town manager about this. We did have a surplus from last year, uh, which he holds in abeyance for emergencies for the following year, and he would consider this as one. Uh, so that does relieve us from immediate pressures, but uh, it might ask as much as a $40,000 adjustment in the current budget. Um, I did, as part of the Finance Subcommittee, give you a sense of what the um, one way in which we could handle that, but I think that the important issue here tonight is simply to understand that there will be a process. As soon as the state budget is adopted, um, we will, I will, of course, then have an actual subsidy figure and we can quickly figure out what the implications for our current budget would be. Anything that we do has to also be done in conjunction with the school, uh, with the town council, because we have a budget and that has been adopted through the process so that, the, and it is a municipal budget, it's part of a municipal budget. 
Uh, so depending on when we get that information, I'm assuming we'll get it early in July. I can't really say for sure, but I think they have to do it pretty soon. Um, then I will immediately inform the board chair and we'll set up a special meeting or we, you do have a workshop scheduled early in July, um, well, fairly early in July. Uh, if that's not, we might be able to use that, that time. But at any rate, we will set a meeting to discuss exactly what steps we have to take. If it's more money, it will be a fairly easy meeting. If it is considerably less, then we've given you some idea of where those cuts would come from. I don't advise you at this time to uh, try to make those cuts. Um, we have enough flexibility in our budget so that I'm, I'm not in a position of having to lay people off in order to adjust that. Fortunately, that surplus from last year does give us a little um, cushion uh, so that there would be some adjustments, as you could see, but they would not be uh, the kinds of things that we have to give 90-day notice, something of that nature. That's all I can say about that. Any questions, comments? Next item on the agenda is new business, recommendations from the co-curricular fee committee. And Connie, I'm going to ask you to explain that. All right. Um, actually, you have two memos from the co-curricular fee committee. And again, for people who are not aware of the process, the teacher contract has language that um, sets up a committee both for athletics and for co-curricular fees to review um, the hours that are assigned to a particular activity uh, and to make recommendations for those hours um, to be either to go up or down depending on what seems to have happened to committees. Some of those recommendations have to do with teacher leadership roles like team leaders. Um, we have a couple of other system-wide positions like affirmative action officer and uh, chem safe coordinator and ADA coordinator. Um, and those also are reviewed from time to time through that process. The actual per hour figure for those activities is negotiated through the regular teacher negotiation bargaining process. But this body and the athletic fee committee body uh, review the uh, structure or the number of hours and make recommendations. So I'd like to take these. Uh, well, okay, this, it's just on one item on the agenda. I'll take them in this order. I'll take the memo first that says recommendations from the co-curricular fee committee. Uh, I won't read everything on it, but it basically is giving you a sense of some of the items that were discussed. Um, there was some discussion about any adjustments that might be needed for team leader fees. There was uh, some adjustment in the middle school co-curricular activities that is student activities uh, for which uh, advisors are paid a stipend because it's over and above the regular teaching uh, assignment. Um, and one of the things that came out of that discussion was the need to have some new activities because for the first time the middle school will really have an operative stage and there would be some opportunity for uh, drama. So there are a few hours in there for drama. There is an art club. There is um, a newspaper club um, that's in lieu of the middle school yearbook. The idea was that uh, maybe you could take a page from the uh, high school, which is now putting out a, uh, the inside. Of course, they're doing that partially as a result of a journalism class, but we thought that was a, a nice model for kids to at least try something along that line. Uh, but the total hours are the same once you subtract the Special Olympics 68 hours move to system-wide position, <coughs> excuse me. But the, um, <clears throat> so that this does not impact the budget. It is simply a way of reassigning hours. Another task of these, uh, thank you very much, um, co-curricular uh, fee committee. Some adjustment in the high school. Uh, some uh, positions had been in there divided between two people. Some adjustment was made to hours as, again, was made in the um, middle school, but the total hours uh, are roughly the same. We also talked about some general procedural issues. One of the things that's different in the co-curricular activities as opposed to um, athletics. Athletics uh, is scheduled against inter scholastics so that there are a certain number of um, 
meets a year or games a year, schedule practices and so forth. And although there are some uh, activities that precede and follow the general um, team season, uh, they've been worked out pretty well over the years, so they're fairly, over the years, they're fairly clear what those are. Um, if, for instance, we have a middle school uh, drama club or a newspaper club and we've estimated hours, they're very modest here, but suppose somebody um, builds up the hours and then has a year when they really don't want to do um, six plays or whatever, um, that was part of the procedure recommended here that the superintendent send out a form at the beginning of the year and ask for an update just exactly what do you intend to do. We don't, we want to give people some flexibility and if need be we can even adjust the stipend. Uh, one person that was at that meeting said that uh, there were times when she really didn't feel that um, an additional activity was required and she'd be happy to give up some of the stipend in lieu of the adjustment. Um, so those, those are the issues that were reviewed. In addition, you will see that there is a recommendation uh, for high school uh, vocal choral, uh, which has uh, not been on the list, and we recommend that we add that. Again, however, by adjusting the hours, just as with the middle school, we come out with the same amount, if not in addition to the budget. The second issue that is under your co-curricular uh, report is one that is a little more complicated. So I gave you uh, a memo plus a job description. Um, as part of the budget process, the monies that we had had in the budget to fund a um, part-time position on teacher certification. Uh, were cut. They were principally cut because, in fact, they had been supported by state money and state money no longer supports certification. Um, so that position disappeared. However, I was asked to meet with the um, certification steering committee because there was a lot of concern among that in, in that group and also among some of the other teachers and administrators that uh, we have a plan on certification, a state required plan. We also have a teacher evaluation plan. Both plans call for a fairly extensive uh, support team uh, network and that has been largely uh, run by the person who, coming up with a title, uh, certification coordinator, who's to some degree what was done or what is projected to be done uh, is outlined in the job description. Um, what their concern was, if this position disappeared as abruptly as it has, um, we would not be able to find a way to readjust both of those plans so that we are in compliance with what we say we are doing. There just isn't enough manpower to do it. Um, they have therefore come back with a proposal. There is money in the budget for stipends for teachers who work on teacher support teams. And that is a requirement of the certification law as it now exists. Um, <clears throat> through our negotiating process, we had originally set those sums, and they are, uh, the certification steering committee has discussed this with a number of teachers and asked if for a one year period people would be willing to take less money. So some of that money could be diverted to fund the part time position that we did have uh, for this one year so that we can rewrite our plans and realign our resources and um, bring the, keep the certification and support team process going. So the proposal you have is to uh, reassign some of those monies, keep the part-time position for a year, um, ask for a rewrite of the plan, and any adjustment that we need to make in our own teacher evaluation instrument. Questions, comments? Charlie? Having been your representative to this co-curricular uh, committee, um, I would like to just explain a little bit about the um, request for reallocation of those uh, support team monies for this uh, position. Um, there would still be about 20 mentors who would be paid at $300 stipend. Uh, the, I asked what would be the time expectation um, they would be expected to give about 30 hours per year. 
Um, they would need to do three observations within the classroom. They would be required to do pre and post conferences with the person that they're supporting. Um, my understanding is that the certification coordinator would then do most of the paperwork. I have a question to, to you, Charlie, then. Does that eliminate the chairperson? Yes, it does. For the support? Okay. And in fact, one of the questions that I asked was, in most cases, currently Mary has been serving essentially as the chair or doing the duties of the chair in many of these support positions, but people were being paid for those positions. So I think knowing that this had been a budgetary cut, I brought certain concerns about um, the tightness of the budget and, and projected years ahead. And one of, one of the re requests that I made of the superintendent that this be a transition year, that some kind of transition plan is put into effect so that we know that probably these monies will not be available next year, even though these particular monies are a uh, contract, contract amount that's set aside for, for um, uh, support of staff. Uh, but I feel it's, a, it's primary that, sh that this particular person support the certification process, but I think it's primary that they are instrumental in setting up a transition plan which allows the teachers, the staff to take on more responsibility for the certification process. I will tell you that I was the lone voter against this recommendation, but that I will support it as a transition plan for one year. Thank you, Charlie. Ann? Well, I guess my primary question is where in the job description does it talk about a transition plan? Um, I know we say it's a transition, but there's nothing in the job description that, that talks about transition types of uh, activities. And I, and I guess I, I have um, several concerns about this that have absolutely nothing to do with the person who has been doing this job because she's done an absolutely wonderful job. Um, but the fact is we, um, we did cut um, this during the budget process and some of the comments that were made were that we were perhaps providing um, a higher level of support for the certification activities than um, are, are done in other, than, uh, that are done in other towns and that perhaps um, the teachers need, need to take on some of these responsibilities for themselves. Um, I'm also uh, concerned um, about the process that was used in terms of approaching teachers who are uh, currently support teachers, um, I think it was a difficult situation for them uh, to be put in the position of uh, looking at the job they're doing in terms of perhaps saving someone else's job. I don't think that's a good process to use because I don't think it gives us a, a real opportunity to look at the pros and cons of um, the system that we currently have in place. It's, it's focused more on the individual doing the job than um, whether we should be doing the job or how well um, the components of the system um, are actually working. And um, thirdly, I think there's an awful lot of overlap in here with um, things that are going to be done by the staff development um, committee. And um, I feel that uh, the board perhaps should have had a little more of a role in this process up to this time because um, you know, this is partly a contractual issue. It does overlap with an awful lot of other areas. And um, just to have the certification committee come up with, uh, with this job description, I don't think it's a very um, complete and inclusive process. So um, for those reasons, I really cannot support, support this request. And I would um, expect that if, um, if, it did not go, if it did not go through, we could still retain um, a certain level of services um, through consulting funds and in the meantime have the staff development committee and the board and the certification committee um, talk about um, and the teachers union 
talk about the best way to go forward. This to me just looks like a position that I know it says it's transitional, but, and maybe it is only funded for one year, but it doesn't look to me like a true transition. Other comments, questions, Charlie? My, my understanding is that this has the support of the, um, the Education Association. In, in the co-curricular discussion of these co-curricular stipends, because this comes under that, even though it's a contractual, um, contractual support piece of the contract, it, was, it, was, it may have been precipitated by the certification committee, but I believe it had the backing of the Education Association for the use of these monies. In, I'm not saying that right. that's how I feel the money should be used, but that is, so there was some process. It didn't come before the full board as a, uh, as a process for discussion. Right, but I'm concerned about um, the actual teachers on the support teams as opposed to just the hierarchy of the union itself and including those teachers in a discussion of the support team system. I don't think we've done that. Well, I think one of the problems that came out in, in this discussion is that the original certification plan was written. I see we have some people here who are part of that. Carrie, when was that plan? Well, no, you weren't here when that plan was written, were you? No. Uh, Nancy, do you know, remember exactly when that plan was written, the original certification plan? The certification plan would have had to have been written and approved by January of 1988. That was by law. Up until then, we piloted some things. Uh -huh. Well, what I discovered in going through this process was that I myself uh, am not familiar with the plan. I have read it once some years ago. What I am more familiar with is the uh, teacher evaluation instrument because that was something that some of us took on right off when we transitioned out of career ladder. We had to have an instrument that uh, was appropriate for the entire staff, not half the staff. And in that process, we talked about support teams um, and gave, a, through that process, frankly committed ourselves to a fairly generous level of support. We also, I uh, did at that time, read the teacher certification plan, referencing it, and realized that at least according to that plan, we also have a generous level of support. If the state is no longer backing that, as they are certainly not backing it with money, um, I imagine we, like any other district in, this, in the state, will have to rethink what we can afford and where our priorities lie. Um, I became aware of this situation as I've reviewed it uh, and feel a certain responsibility for not having um, been aware that this was going to happen. I simply was not aware that the state had pulled the rug out from it totally. And uh, we haven't researched it. You're absolutely right. But this does say here, this part-time position will be funded for the 1995-96 school year to provide a transition from our current certification and support team plans. Um, it should say more explicitly to, pro to provide another one. Um, and I appreciate that it's an awkward process, but it was the best one we could come up with. And these funds, by the way, are committed to support. They can't be used for anything else. It's not a matter of, of transferring them. Uh, and the, at least the co-curricular committee and the certification steering committee um, in the time frame and with the somewhat truncated process we had to use um, do support it, but um, I can appreciate your point that we need a, a wider process to rewrite, please. Charlie? Oh, Carla, sorry. Um, just a quick question. Would the stipends automatically after one year go back up to the current level, would that be an automatic thing? They would go back to the level that would be agreed upon as a result of the transition plan, whatever that was. Uh -huh. okay. Gail? Well, continuing on with Connie's thought, if we, can, if we write in the job description that this is to be a transition plan year, uh, and we know that the state is taking out the funding for all the different districts. Is it feasible to have this person coordinate with Scarborough and South Portland or other districts to, to um, have similar plans and work towards transition 
on a bigger scale? Well, we are now doing that with the administrators. Um, that is the way the administrative certification was originally set up. Um, and there's been some discussion of that, and I think it's referenced here somewhere. At the top. Oh, yes, it is. Um, they are certainly that offers some possibilities. But could that be the charge of this job description to explore those possibilities? Oh, yes. And, okay. Yes, certainly. Charlie? Just a clarification on the staff development. They cleaned up the original because there was some misconception. The staff development aspect only has to do with their certification. It has nothing to do with our curriculum development, that kind of staff development. And as far as the, the amount that's budgeted for, for next year, that is the amount that we have, um, that we have uh, negotiated with the teachers association so you know the amount next year could be reduced if we so negotiate it but for next year for the current contract that we will ratify at the end of this meeting it's already built in okay. so i have to ask you about that i don't understand what you just said so we've already built in the mentor stipends of 300 we've already built in the total amount of money okay the twenty two thousand dollars Okay. which is what it was in the last contract. It's what will be in, in the contract we will ratify at the end of this meeting. No, I understand now. How it's allocated, this is, this is the, the will of the Education Association and the Certification Committee and came out of a recommendation from co-curricular committee. Anne? I guess I would just like to see, um, in addition to the job description, is what is the plan for advancing from this point on? I mean, just, it's one thing to say we're going to transition out of it, but here we are, you know, creating a bona fide position here, and um, I, I would really like to see a timeline and a plan and the players in the process of getting out of this system. Well, very simply, we have to go back to the original plan. Um, the, either the Certification Steering Committee, or, which is a sort of a year-to-year -year committee, um, but hopefully they will agree to uh, keep on through this process um, and to review it, to pull it apart, to take the current, as I said, the uh, teacher evaluation plan, which also involves uh, language about uh, the system's commitment for support teams and to um, make some recommendations. So that's a rewriting issue, and that would be the first vehicle. Uh, we'd also be dealing with the, uh, the uh, Teachers Association in addition to that steering committee, and I would certainly expect the school board to be involved with that as well as myself. I think that um, the, there is, of course, the issue of getting through next year. That is, we have people who are required by law to have support teams and those things have to keep on going and the various certification issues have to go on um, as far as negotiating with uh, or uh, approaching people in the other uh, districts. Uh, Mary in her capacity working with the administrators is already doing that so it's a matter of, of uh, her scheduling meetings with the appropriate people to do that. Those things are already very clear. I mean we would know that those things had to happen. At some point the uh, revised certification. I think the other thing, frankly, that, that I can't tell you right now is just exactly where the state is coming down on certification. This was a, a major piece of the 84 um, Reform Act was uh, certification, frankly, used to be taking a couple of courses and in, in calling um, one person in Augusta. Uh, and as the 84 Act mandated that every local district have a committee and a process and the teacher action plans for recertification must go through that process. They have to be signed by a local person. Um, it seems to me that the state has lost its enthusiasm for that. It may, may not be true, but at least uh, they're certainly not supporting it anymore. Uh, I don't know where they're going to come down. Are they going to go back to uh, the old routine, which uh, bypassed any local groups? Are they going to disband local groups? I don't know. That's something else we have to find out. Other questions, comments? I just wanted to make a comment myself that um, I can only support this for a 
one year transition with the charge that a transition plan with timeline has to be incorporated into this position. And I think the intent was there in the description, but I want to be sure that it, 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 is actually, um, it is actually there with the timeline. Um, and those were my comments. So you Do need, need some motions. <laughs> <coughs> well, having been your representative to the co-curricular fee, I first will move that we accept the recommendations of the co-curricular fee committee for the hours and, ass and assigned to activities and the deletions and additions of activities for the 95-96 school year. Is there a second? Uh, any discussion? I have one other question um, a little bit differently. On the integration coordinator position, um, it was listed as a new stipend recommended for further clarification and consideration. Um, I just wanted to know a little bit more about that and um, what it would involve. That was brought forward by the Special Education Department um, as a need that has arisen because of the number of children uh, through the inclusion model who require more than the usual attention. Um, when we get to the part of the agenda where we are nominating people to fill positions, um, I will note to you that a name was placed there, but it should be crossed off because um, we haven't finished this process. It, t it speaks in these notes of the superintendent being asked to go back to the special ed department, get a job description, and also the issue was raised in that discussion about that position, if it were to be approved, being a more systemic position because it was limited to Pond Cove. So that's an unfinished process there, and when we get to the nomination piece, um, I will ask you to cross that one off the list. Thank you. Okay, so just to be clear, we're just accepting basically the memo right now, the recommendations. We're not accepting the position, any no. of the actual people named. That's correct. Those are two separate clear. issues. There, are, there have been right. some adjustments and additions to activities, right. such as the superintendent has alluded to. I just want people to be clear what we're, what we're right. voting on the document, not the position. I would just like to comment on the high school mixed chorus director jazz band. Uh, that is an increase in hours, um, and that is an activity that I believe will take place probably after school. It is something that the, the new um, instrumental um, teacher implemented this year because we have had a very low um, participation rate in course. We have a very strong program in the, in the elementary middle school, which has grown over the years, but children's students' um, schedules tend to get very full, and that doesn't mean that they don't have the desire or the talent to, to participate, but it was, was offered as an academic course scheduled during the day in the past and has been very difficult with very low participation. I think what we saw was an, an increase uh, to somewhat in, in that particular um, uh, activity as it was offered after school. In fact, they, in fact, they met in the evening. What we have also seen is an increase in um, jazz ensemble um, work done by the current um, instrumental um, teacher. And uh, again, an increase in participation. He's tried to have balance both of those, and it is very hard. So what I'm, what I'm envisioning, I think, is someone else probably will be filling the mixed course director co-curricular position. That's my understanding. That is my understanding. And, and that uh, Mr. Richardson will continue to, to work with the jazz band ensembles. Um, the other thing that I would comment about the high school positions and ours that, that speech, debate, drama have all stayed at the same levels of ours. Thank the, you. Any the, other the realization of the additional hours for um, the instrumental music and the jazz band came at evaluating other uh, co-curricular hours of other activities, and a few, a couple were dropped. 
Any other comments, questions? All those in favor? Seven zero. Okay, the, the next motion would be the creation of a certification coordinator from the budget line item 9010411110 to include a $16,500 position and $6,000 remaining to be mentor stipends at $300 a piece. Is there a second? Second. Priscilla? Discussion? Carla? Not to add a lot to what's already been said, but um, just sort of to share how um, I've been sitting here for the past 10 minutes absolutely flip-flopping. Um, I was unhappy with this cut in the first place when we first had to make it, but having done it, I share Charlie's initial concerns as a member of that committee about bringing in proposals after the budget process is finished, and then I also share Ann's concerns with the uh, the people who are in the, uh, the stipend positions now. So I really don't have an answer. I just thought I'd share how, <laughs> how you know, not very obvious this is. And probably until the second I raise my hand, I'm obviously not sure how which way I'm leaning, but I'll decide in the next few seconds, so. <laughs> Any other comments, Charlie or Priscilla? Charlie. Well, I'd like to reinforce that I think we need um, ongoing feedback from this, um, from the coordinator about the plan of how is, the position is going to be phased out, and that we are very, if we vote for this, we are very clearly saying as a board that it is a one-year part-time position, and that it won't be there after this year. Charlie. I think we need to support staff, and if this is a request from staff to use monies that are that are negotiated, but I also feel that we need we need a process. This was after the process, but I will support it with those stipulations that I mentioned earlier. Any other questions, comments? All those in favor? Six, all those against? One. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is personnel request. Superintendent. And the first item under that is to bring to you a nomination for the principal of Ponco School. Uh, many of you now have had a chance to meet Tom Eismeyer, um, and I have, in fact, included his resume for any of you who weren't involved, but I think you all actually met Tom. Um, we also distributed to all of our staff the, um, uh, a letter explaining our process. We reviewed 44 applications, drew up criteria for what we were looking for, asked faculty, staff, and parents to fill out input sheets. Um, our uh, principal search committee included two members of the school board. Um, two administrators, um, three teachers, and two parents. And uh, we spent quite a lot of time on this process, um, interviewing a number of people, some of them twice, and inviting people to visit the school and talk to a number of people, including a couple of parent groups. Um, and so as a result of this process, we have made a choice, and I am nominating Tom Eismeyer for anybody who hasn't followed this. Uh, just very quickly, he is currently an elementary principal in Vermont um, and uh, has taught elementary school for many years as well as having been a principal. Um, his educational background, he graduated uh, from Princeton uh, with a BA in English with honors um, with a prize in Old English. I'm not exactly sure. I asked him how he uses that in elementary education. I can think of some interesting applications. Um, he has uh, an MA in English from the University of Chicago and has his MED in elementary and early childhood education from Antioch. Um, so with pleasure, I nominate Tom Eismeyer to be our new principal of Pine Cove. Is there a second? Second. I, I'm just nominated. <laughs> right. I don't we need a motion. Right. <laughs> 
I need a motion. Oh. Anne? <laughs> I, I move that we approve the appointment of Tom Eismeyer as the Pond Cove principal. Is there a second? Priscilla. Any discussion? Anne? I would just um, like to say that having not served on the committee, um, my only exposure to the candidates was through the meeting that was set up that any parent um, could attend. And I thought that was a, an excellent addition to the, uh, to the process of choosing a principal. I think the, the parents felt very included. I think it added a whole new dimension. It enabled us to see the candidates in a different way. Um, and I, I hope we'll continue that in the future. Charlie? I would second that, having served on um, administrative search committees before. And I thought it was a very effective process. Keith? Yeah, similarly, the uh, input that we got from all the, the staff um, after they had met the final candidates, I really appreciated their input on those pieces of paper that they filled out about each person. Any other comments? I'll just say I enjoyed serving on the committee and thank all of the teachers who served and the parents who participated. And um, it was a, a very um, good process. All those in favor? Seven zero. Yeah. Yeah. He tells me that they will be um, moving in the area shortly. He expects to start work on the week of July 10th. So he will be in residence and able to meet people and solve all our problems. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have administratively two or three interesting little issues sitting on his doorstep already. I will write him a letter and let him know. <laughs> and then we have superintendent's nominations for new teachers for 95-96 school year. And um, since I distributed your packets as I indicated to you, we would be having some additions. So let me run through these. Um, the, in your original packet, we had uh, an appointment at the high school for special education. Uh, Tom Robinson, who was working this year on a one-year contract, um, and uh, also uh, as part of the budget process, you approved a half-time special education reading teacher, uh, and I'm nominating Barbara McDonald for that. Um, the two additions to your original list in, included in your packet are uh, resumes and some background information. We're really welcoming back um, a former member of our Cape Elizabeth group, Michael Efron, who is coming back to teach high school math, and uh, a newcomer, Jeffrey Rosenblum, who is um, nominated to teach uh, four classes of science and one class of math. And as you, you are certainly familiar with Michael's background, but the, um, you don't know Mr. Rosenblum. Um, as you can see, he is a beginner, but he is one of our teachers who comes to us from a working background and goes through what the University of Maine calls the ETEP program. He's a graduate of Carnegie Mellon uh, with a BS in civil engineering with a double major in engineering and public policy. I think it's a real interesting combination. Um, and uh, has been an environmental engineer and he will be teaching some of our environmental science classes. Uh, you can see he's also done computer consulting and recycling. So we'll make him the chief of the recycling committee in the high school. <laughs> Do I have a motion? Carla? I move that we accept the superintendent's nominations uh, for new teachers, Tom Robinson, um, special education resource room full-time, Barbara McDonald, special education reading teacher half-time, Michael Efron, um, high school math full-time, and Jeffrey Rosenblum, high school science. Um, four classes math, one class full time, um, all at the high school. A second. Any discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. I have requests for unpaid leaves of absence. And um, the three requests here. Uh, Betsy Wiley, who's been out for this year on an unpaid leave full-time, is asking to work a uh, six-tenth position. Um, actually, since we had had her in the budget at full-time, it does yield some savings in our budget. 
um, and her letter is included. Gail Adset is requesting also to work a reduced schedule, and her letter is in your packet. Both of these teachers, of course, will be, uh, this is a year-to-year -year and one-year um, uh, condition, and we do expect them back full-time next year. Uh, and Mary Grabel, who has been out on a health issue, is uh, asking for a year's leave of unpaid absence for health reasons. Um, I have had a conversation with her explaining that her position of reading recovery is one we cannot leave unfilled because it's an important part of our, our project. So um, I'm nom I am recommending her request at a half-time position, which is what she was holding when she left. So that would be a one-year leave of unpaid leave at a half-time position for Mary Grabell. Do I have a motion? Gail, you can. <laughs> I can so move. So move. Is there a second? I second it, but I, I just need clarif yeah. clarification on Gail's. What, it, what is, it says half time, is that? Uh... Uh, I think it's six tenths, um, Rick, for Gail. Six tenths. Mm -hmm. Do we have a second on that? Charlie. Yes, I did. Is there any other discussion, questions? All those in favor? 7-0. Resignations. Two resignations. Um, one of them from the high school staff, Chris Newell, who has been a part-time math teacher at the high school. Um, and her letter is also in your packet. She's decided to um, Resign. She has had a good experience, but she has decided that it's time for her to give more time to her family. We thank Chris for all of her many contributions and know that we will be seeing her. Uh, and the other resignation is Janet Hannigan, who's been with Food Service Department for many years and has decided to retire at the end of this year. Certainly want to recognize Janet. She's given long and faithful service, um, and uh, we really appreciate all of those meals and cheerful comments with kids um, and hope that she enjoys her retirement. So move. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a second? Second. You're going to let her get away with it? I don't know. <laughs> I'll train her afterwards. <clears throat> Is there some discussion, Charlie? I would just like to, having had children who have gone through the system in 13, in the last 13 years, and Janet has been in the kitchen in those 13 years, and having been a personal friend of Janet's, um, she will sorely be missed. Her smile will be missed. She was well thought of by children. And, uh, and she did serve as a school board member in the yeah. 70s. So. That's right. I was teaching here when she was. So she will be greatly missed. Uh, it's very, maybe she went for the school board. <laughs> I'd also just like to say about uh, Janet that, um, that there was one year I was the chair of the ice cream social at Pond Cove, and anybody who's been through that knows what I mean when I say I couldn't have done it without her. She was, she was a great help. That is quite an ordeal, and she, as Charlie said, she was always very cheerful. And out of gratitude, I noticed she had a very broken down chair at that time, and I brought her one from home. And um, Maybe we should put a plaque on it if it's still, still around. <laughs> In her memory, the Janet Hannigan chair. To Jan the Janet <laughs> Hannigan chair. It'll probably it's probably being thrown out with the new furniture coming in. But. <laughs> Charlie, have my wife having been one of the originators of the ice cream social. I'm glad that you took over. It was well, a capable I haven't done it for many years, but oh. <laughs> it's a tough one. But I know any time that there was a a function in the Pond Cove cafeteria that involved the kitchen, Jana was always there and uh, was very helpful, and not just for the school lunch program, but for, for, for the after-school activities also. Thank you. All those in favor? 7-0. Next item on the agenda is policies, first reading. There are two policies tonight for a first reading. 
The first one is athletic field trips, file IJOA. Um, this was researched by Gail and worked on with Keith Weatherby. Um, and um, any questions or comments? Anne? <laughs> No offense, but I found this really hard to understand what kinds of trips it was referring to. Um, tournaments, championships, um, training trips, or you know what I'm saying? It just says extended trips, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm just not sure um, what that refers to. So I, I think we need to just clarify if this is different from just going off to a game and another that, that, town and coming that was back or what but it's it's just not very clear and I think we need to be more specific um, about about what okay. we're referring to I'm sure as a new policy chair and <laughs> I guess I can probably <laughs> any other comments <laughs> This would be a policy that we would um, accept at our next school board meeting, which would be before school starts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is there any way that, that the athletic director could at least give a draft to coaches? Because we do have a time frame of by June and, or the end of June, and this policy will not be in effect before September. <coughs> and I think there are trips that are planned during the summer months that fall under the guise of training. And I think those coaches need to be aware. Good. And it, it seems to me the intent of this is basically to make it the same as the field trips in terms of requirements and notification. And I think until, isn't that correct? This, the, the wording is not that different from the no, original. I, no, I know Keith it is. Has. Okay. It's just, just to me, it's not clear exactly what types of trips it's referring to. But I think until we have one specifically, specifically for athletics, they should be operating under the assumption that any any trip any out of trip. state or overnight should fall under those other guidelines. Because the second paragraph under A is exactly the same as the extended field trips for right. for anyone. Any other comments? The other um, policy that we worked on for first reading tonight is the Cape Elizabeth School Department's use of facilities, guidelines, and policies. Um, Sue Weatherby set up a committee, I think it was in the winter, that Gail and I served on with members of the town council and um, lots of individuals to look at how all of our facilities are used, um, what should be the priority of use, how they would, uh, how the reservations would be run, scheduling, um, and fees associated with them. Um, this is an incredibly complicated process, and it, it really absorbed an incredible amount of time, and so I'm sure there are questions on it. Sue is sorry she can't be here tonight, um, but I think Gail and I, having served on that committee, can hopefully um, clarify some of people's concerns. Um, but any questions? Carla. Um, it's more of a typo when I say a small question since at the policy committee we discussed this, so I don't really have any content questions. Um, under general expectations for all facilities, that was reworked a little bit from one of the earlier drafts we had. And number two says, Respect for equipment and facility is expected at all times. If damage occurs, please report it to community services. And what that seems to replace is a statement that she had in an early draft that said, do not tamper with materials and supplies that do not belong to you. And I wonder if the new wording is a little too soft. I don't know if people prefer it to be a little stronger like it was in her original draft. I thought that the do not tamper with Maybe people might think that was too harsh, but I'm almost afraid she went almost the other way so that people aren't really clear that, you know, it's, you say respect for equipment, you're walking in a building, you're being polite, but the other one, it was more clear that don't touch things that don't involve your activity. 
I will pass it on. She did rework this to figure out some of the things we had worked on, and she did send it to me after she worked it, reworked it to see if I had any mm -hmm. major differences right. with it. Um, so I'm sorry. Well, people might, you know, disagree yeah. with that and think that it's just fine. Respect for equipment might cover that. But yeah. And the only other thing I had was um, <clears throat> under uh, building and equipment security, just above the number one. It says to ensure building security. Should that be to ensure instead of to insure? Yeah. Is that a typo or grammar or what? Uh, or is that the correct word? It's okay. okay. Any, Charlie? Just a question concerning the, under general expectations that Carla just read, um, under the insurance supervision, um, is that just to cover liability or is that to cover damage also? Where, where are you? I'm looking at insurance. I'm in relationship to damage that occurs, mm -hmm. who's liable. We talked a lot about insurance and that groups will have to provide um, more insurance um, proof than they have in the past. I am not exactly it's not for physical, sure. I'm talking about not for, um, I'm talking more about physical damage to the facility, not so much liability, liability. for um, accident. I think we discussed mostly liability issues, but um, that's certainly. I would have some, some interest in, in making sure that damage is, if it's not under school activity, is covered. I thought we, we explored that and that our coverage covers regardless of what the activity is in the building. Okay, my, mine would be the expectation from people that are non-school users? It's a good question to ask. And we did have a whole meeting on insurance with Scott. And I actually can't remember all of the details of it. But that's something we can ask back. Well, the typical answer to that one is you bill them uh, for damage that's not you know, covered under normal issues. Whether you get the money or not, it's not a story. But um, that would be the you know, the normal routine. I, I, since I'm saying something, I would like to just make the general point. This looks complicated, and there certainly is an awful lot of detail, and I appreciate the process. Um, we did talk about putting an article in, in the Courier at some point to try to give people not so much every detail, but um, it's really important to understand that we're not trying to be bureaucratic with this uh, kind of approach. Um, the original committee, and I have not gone to all the meetings, included Billy Jordan from the town council. Uh, and we have certainly talked to Michael about some of these issues. We really want this, the school department's philosophy in this is that we are only the guardians and the custodians of the physical plants. We are not, we do not own them. The community owns them. It is, however, important in order to have uh, as much use as possible uh, without all kinds of hassles, we have to have some kind of fairness policy. And we also have to protect the town as well as people sometimes from themselves uh, in, in requiring certain levels of liability insurance. Um, we do have heavy use of our buildings. And with newly renovated buildings coming online, we expect to have a lot of requests for those buildings. Therefore, we are trying to provide as best we can a clear blueprint in advance so people will understand and not uh, feel that we're being arbitrary and capricious about these decisions. Uh, in conjunction with this, we also will be working on a written plan of maintenance. Um, it is our commitment this year to make sure that we take all the manuals and various other kinds of repair issues uh, that we will be inheriting from the construction project and turn them into timelines. You know, how many times are we supposed to change the filters on the boilers and so on? That also is going to look very detailed, but that's our responsibility. We are the guardians of the building, and we understand what a, a burden it is to the taxpayer to provide them, and we want them used, but we don't want them abused, and that's what the intent of this policy is. Ann? Um, just a couple questions. Um, what was the reasoning uh, about having nonprofit organizations outside Cape Elizabeth come before Cape Elizabeth profit organizations? Uh, we just sort of decided that nonprofit had priority and the over profit. 
um, even though they were out of town. Um, it, it was just the decision of the group, and that's the priority of use order. When it comes to um, the fees and rates, uh, it is a little, it, it can vary or it could be the same. I personally feel like any Cape Elizabeth group, anybody who's paying taxes here, whether they're nonprofit or profit, um, should probably have priority over somebody from out of town. Um, and also uh, under the reservations, um, where it says community services shall authorize all equipment usage and reserves the right to refuse or cancel any equipment or facility request. Um, I, think, I think that needs to appear, well first of all I feel like it's a little bit buried um, there, but I also think it needs to uh, appear on the application for use so that people know when, they, when they're applying that you know, they may not be approved for, for something. And just one final comment. I found this format just kind of hard to follow. And I'm wondering if there's just some way to, um, you know, to, to fix the layout so it's a little easier to read. It seems it's very hard to follow um, the flow of the information. And I don't have any specific editorial comments about it right now, but um, Sue's very good at this. Yes, she is. I'm sure she can set it up in some way just so it's, it's much clearer to see, you know. They were trying to keep it on one sheet, yeah. which might be too ambitious. I, I think it might, because I think it's just <laughs> very hard to, yeah. to read yeah. through all this fine print. She has obviously been very busy, and, yeah, oh, wow. this, oh, yeah. and I'm sure she's happy to, uh, to work on this some more. But yeah. the intent was to um, get it passed so that these were rates and things were all in effect as quickly as possible. I know how very much work this was for all of you, and it's, it's obvious, and you really have covered you know, all, all the details, and I think, it's, I think that's great. You're all to be commended, because that's a very painstaking headache of a task. Any other comments, Keith? Well, only just a picky one up under general expectations. Uh, the school board has prohibited the possession of and use of tobacco, alcohol, and other mm. drugs on school grounds. I was wondering if maybe we should have something about state and federal law in there. Great, we'll get the comments back to Sue and okay. they can go through the next policy meeting and hopefully the changes will be made for the next board meeting. There is a state statute and I think it's under our drug and alcohol policy. There's also a federal statute. Yep. Any other comments? Next item on the agenda is nominations for co-curricular activities for 95-96. Well, um, I have a long list here of nominations for different positions, but I think I'll cut right to the quick uh, since we've already had comments on this and some people are still here. Um, and then we'll go back over the rest of them. Um, the, the issue of um, nominations at the high school for speech and debate is that program has been the subject of a lot of discussion and a lot of soul searching in various ways by myself as well as the high school administration. Uh, we have met with some parents, we have also had phone calls and conversations and we certainly heard some comments this evening. I simply want to say from my own point of view, I respect all of those comments. I certainly think they are um, uh, very understandable. Um, I also have deep respect for this program. Um, I am convinced it is an important part of the high school um, curriculum in a sense, and certainly uh, co-curricular activities, and uh, nothing that I am about to recommend is certainly not my intention to in any way injure that program. However, I have made a decision that I am going to nominate two new people for the general oversight of the speech and debate program. Um, we do not have the exact breakdown of responsibility or hours. Uh, this is a program that has also brought in other people from the community. I would expect that to continue, uh, but I do not have that at this point. Um, I also heard clearly from parents and from students that it is important to hear from them directly what the 
uh, experiences that they have uh, valued, what kinds of uh, activities are important, how do we uh, not only maintain uh, what we have, but perhaps in some way um, even broaden that process, but certainly in all ways support it. Uh, I think that kind of meeting does need to occur, but I also uh, do believe that I will, um, uh, in my judgment, it is important to nominate these two people, and I will do so right now, and that is Sarah Franklin and Dwight Ely to be in charge of the speech and debate program next year at the high school. Is there a motion and then discussion? Yeah, but I do, sorry. And I, I would move that we accept the nominations of Sarah Franklin and Dwight Ely um, uh, for the speech and debate co-curricular positions. Is there a second? I second that. Charlie, discussion? Charlie? You know, I, this has been a very, very hard process, having sat with parents as one of three school board members having been on the board the last six years, having dealt with many issues uh, in the last couple of years as a, as a board. Um, we have an exemplary, exemplary pro, uh, program. We have had year after year many state champions and have sent on to the nationals many teams. Um, but we as a board, I think, really have to look at everything from a systemic process and how, how individuals and not only programs impact the staff, the students, and um, the system as a whole. Um, and I think we have to support whatever, whatever recommendations that come forward from, from staff administrators and the superintendent. It's a very hard decision, but I will have to support it. I truly support um, Mrs. Hayward's suggestion that we sit down as, as with the new um, co-curricular um, people in place and talk to parents who have children in the, in the program, who've had children in the program, who students who have themselves been in the program to, to get a sense of how things have been done in the past and the type of training they receive, the type of support they receive to make this program continue to be successful. Ann? Um, I'd like to thank all the parents and the students who, who came tonight and um, I wished more had stayed. I know it's hard when we've got uh, a long agenda. Um, I would like to point out that we did, in fact, already have met with, with uh, parents one time. Um, I think we've uh, demonstrated that we're open to do that, and I think that um, as the program moves forward, um, it would certainly be appropriate to sit down with, uh, with the new staff people and uh, have a discussion about the future of the program. I truly believe that the future of this program can be extremely bright if we will all stay involved with it, stay with it. Um, I'll say what I said at the meeting we had with the parents, and that is I think it's critical that the parents um, be involved in this, um, form some kind of booster club, stay involved. Um, I think it would be good to hear from, it's certainly good to hear from the kids about what they want to continue to get out of the program. Um, but lastly, I'd just like to say that um, this is a difficult position we sit in sometimes. Things that look really easy to parents because they've had a particular experience isn't always the entire picture. And sometimes we have to sit up here and um, work through a decision um, that is extremely difficult, that takes a long time, that's <laughs> this, you know, this one in particular complicated beyond belief. But finally, we just we have to make a decision that we think is in the best interest of the system as a whole. Um, I feel confident that um, we'll continue to support this very excellent program, and I hope that uh, you know if if we vote to accept these two people um, as the new staff people in charge of the program, that you will 
work with us to, to make, this, make this a good program. But I hope you will also please try to understand the position that we're in. We can't always talk about all the things that go into a decision. It's one of the most difficult things about this position. So I appreciate, appreciate it if you keep that in mind. Other comments? Keith? Only that uh, to echo what Ann said, we have to look at the, at the big picture. Um, uh, I think it's very important that as a school board that we don't uh, try to micromanage any of our buildings and so forth, and I, and I take great uh, confidence in our administrators and our superintendent, and I, I, I want to support them. Other comments? I just wanted to thank also the parents and the students who came and spoke tonight. This is an issue that we have all thought long and hard about. Um, all those in favor? Seven. All those opposed? Motion carries, seven zero. Do I have a motion to uh, look at the other co curricular appointments? Um, I'll run down quickly to make sure we all have the same ones. Um, on the page one under the Han Cove integration coordinator, uh, there is a name there that should be strike. Um, please strike that out because, in fact, that one, as we pointed out earlier, is not a finished process. So that doesn't belong there. The rest of them on that page uh, for team leaders at Pine Cove, team leaders at the middle school, um, department chairs at the high school. Um, that's it on that page. Um, the next page, page, uh, it says co-curricular student activities. Um, you have some middle school. There are some blanks. Those blanks will be filled in once school starts, but most of them are already filled in. Uh, and at the high school, we have a lot of blanks here, but there will be some of that filled in. And with the names that are on there, and please note that we've already called your attention to the fact that uh, Mr. Richardson is nominated for the jazz band, um, which is, uh, and then up above you have the vocal choral. That is open. That, that will be posted in-house uh, later. And this is a year when we expect to do the musical, um, and Mr. Mullen is nominated for drama, and obviously Mr. Richardson for musical director for the musical. I have a motion. Charlie. I move the nominations put forth by the superintendent for co-curricular um, positions for the 95-96 school year. Second. Second, Carla. Any discussion? I have one comment. The newspaper at Pond Cove. Mm -hmm. That's a new position. Oh, yes. That one um, was not taken up by the co-curricular. Uh, again, the that was a budget line that Pond Cove was carrying, and it came up in discussion after our co-curricular meeting actually uh, so I asked Scott to transfer it over here where it belongs we don't have anybody uh, to nominate and I guess from my conversation with you earlier you were pointing out to me that that it has been a parent volunteer issue well that was my understanding I know the PCPA the first year of the newspaper gave some money I think to pay for the supplies and I didn't know if maybe that's the five hundred dollars we're seeing and the, the kids, when they register, it's an after-school activity, and their fees, I thought, directly compensated the program. But, Wayne, I don't know. Yeah, I just, I, I you don't, don't know. know all the details. Yeah. I know it did purchase some of the supplies and, and film and stuff like that, but that, that amount of the supplies don't think it would be. Yeah, I don't think it was a, a, there's well, a stipend position at all associated with it. There was a faculty advisor, though. Was that just a voluntary? The, the, yes, it was. That was done on voluntary basis. This, this past year, um, Ogden Williams. Did he also helped, do that helped out with that? No. Was no, there a faculty advisor the first year? Was I don't think so. 
I, I thought he was paid through the fees that were collected, um, like oh, an after school adventure. Know. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, that doesn't have a name. There's not, nothing for you to prove. And I will make a note here that this, and as I said, it, oh, sorry, Charlie, but it hasn't no, gone sorry. through the co curricular. I was going to say, I have a hard time approving this as a co curricular position because it was never discussed under the co curricular right. fee yeah. structure committee. So therefore, I would amend my motion to delete that position. I need a second to my amendment. I second. Uh, I, I yeah. second it. And um, I guess if it's really been through community services, that, that does have to be clarified. OK. About really what the, what the nature of that I will. Is. I will check into that. That was a, an issue that was brought up through quickly. We haven't researched it. I take it under advisement. We will take care of it. Can I just clarify? We've deleted that as a co-curricular. We haven't deleted it per se. No, 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 no. Just clarifying where it belongs. Mm -hmm. yeah. I know the PCPA is still searching for a parent to run that program. It's a, it's a PCPA position to be the newspaper coordinator. So. <laughs> um, any other discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. Next item on the agenda is uh, nominations for athletic coaching positions for fall 95 96. Okay, you have a separate sheet. You have two sheets actually. One was additional for spring, the other one was for fall. Um, I don't think there's anything here. That, we, that I have to comment on. I guess the, the athletic director has made the request that line 26, which has had the title house manager, should be called uh, assistant AD at the high school. Um, that's a position that Sam Boothby um, has been carrying all these years. So the sheet. Charlie, sorry. I have an issue with bringing coaches that have come before us as the seasons are already over. It's an issue with any position that is um, recommended and hired without, that's not a budgeted position that, that the board does not get to see until it's already in place. In a very tight budgetary year that's going to be ahead of us, uh, I think the process has got to be that the positions have to come through the superintendent to the board for approval before they're ever put in place. And, and we've talked about this, and I think it's got to take place. I, I, I understand the procedural point, Charlie, but it's my understanding, at least for the seventh and eighth grade spring B team, that was in the budget. It, it was a budgeted item for our current operating budget. Okay. But why position takes long to come before the board? That's I mean, a very good question, um, which I would need to answer with my colleague, Andy Strout, instead of by myself. However, um, I know in the past, in other years, we've used that position sometimes to, it's been more frequently used to help in the overflow in baseball. This year, we used it with spring track because of the numbers. But it was a position that we had in our budget. Anne? I, I I guess my problem is that we not only have to budget these things, but we are the ones who are supposed to approve these people. And I, I think we should know who they are before the school year is over. I think we should know about them in a much more timely manner than this. What good does it do to approve these people at this point in terms of whether we had any issues or any problems with these people? It doesn't, it doesn't do anybody any good um, to do this now. Um, so, and, and if it is the role of the assistant athletic director for the middle school, they have an issue with that position approving it for next year. Well, this, this, that's just for the middle school one. The assistant tennis no, team position that. was no, not a middle school that. position. I also have a problem with that one coming before us because it's a change in structure than what was actually budgeted. I'm not, I don't have any problems with the money. I'm having a problem with the, ch the positions changing and the people being recommended after a season is over or already in place. 
Right, and I absolutely understand that point about the people coming um, afterwards. I know for us, sometimes it depends on how many students we have who not only sign up, which occurs for us in April, but, um, and I'm not sure if it happened before the April board meeting or, or after that, but also once the practices really start and how many students stay with an activity. Uh, we had approximately 60, 65 students, I believe, out for spring track, for instance, this year. There are multiple events um, in that athletic activity, and at first we weren't sure everyone was going to stay with it. However, they, they did almost to a person stay with it for throughout the season, so we realized we needed to have more assistance there than in our baseball, softball, or lacrosse, or tennis um, situations. And we, this would have been more timely, at least to come to you no later than May. I understand the position that it would be even better if it came to you prior to the spring beginning and uh, we will work to that end in the future. Carla? Are we going to handle the um, votes for fall and spring separately? Whatever well, the, you can. Whatever the motion <clears throat> is. What we've sort of been commenting on here are the spring ones. Is that correct? No, the ones I'm commenting on right now are the, the, the spring, spring sports right. that have already concluded. And we're approving positions or people for those positions. And I have a problem with the process. Yeah, I, I have a serious problem with it. And I also guess, you know, most of the time we're approving um, people who are on our staff anyway, and we know something about them. Um, and I guess I'd like to just have a little background on some of these people. I'm a little unclear about the hiring process for some of these coaches and what their qualifications are and such. And I think, you know, if we're going to approve people, number one, we should know a little bit about them. But number two, we should have a chance to see them before. <laughs> the season's over. So maybe next year we well, can do um, better. Duly listening, but I think we need to have a conversation and we will improve the process. Uh, um, maybe Rick can answer. Um, is there a need for four tennis coaches because of numbers? Do they need four tennis coaches because of the numbers of kids? And this includes boys and girls. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? I'd just like to reiterate what both Charlie and Anne and Carla, we, we really do have to see these before it's over. And we really need to see um, a resume or something about these people. Um, and hopefully that can happen for any fall appointments that will be made at the last minute. Um, thank you. Could I have a motion, please? Charlie. I move the appointment of Assistant Tennis Bill Brown, 7th and 8th Spring B Team, Kevin Sears for the Spring 1995 season. Second. Second, Gail. Any discussion? All those in favor? 7-0. We need another motion on the fall. fall. Carla? I move that we accept the nominations for um, athletic coaching positions for fall 1995-1996. Is there a second? Second. Gail? Oh, any discussion? Charlie? There is a recommendation from the athletic director to change the house manager fall season to an assistant AD. I'm trying to reflect back to our um, athletic fee committee if we ever really discussed that. I don't think so. I remember I that so there was some discussion about. We knew that the Sam was going to be retiring. Right. We did. And I believe we had a discussion that the hours would probably be adjusted because there was some request for additional hours for. Um, one of these large groups, and there was some flexibility in there to a, So I'm not sure. These are uh, not really sure what the, well, this sheet doesn't tell us exactly what the hours were this year. Uh, I can't answer that question. Okay. What we are now doing is approving the people that are being recommended. That's correct. What I would like to do is to, before that position gets filled, we have some discussion okay. of why there's a need 
because I think we may need to look at the whole assistant athletic director positions, both middle and high school. Mm -hmm. Hasn't that always been Mr. Boothby's position? He's yeah. been a house manager. What duties are, as an assistant athletic director, what's the difference? Other than the title? Than the, other than the title. Why, why the need for a title? There must be going to be more responsibility, I would assume. Mm -hmm. and? and Keith is a part-time athletic director, right? right. So yeah, I, I do think we need to figure out why we would need, need an assistant AD to a part-time AD. Um, we will get back to you. He's a part. He's a half-time AD right. who puts in full-time. He, he does. Well, put in hours. That, that may be true, but I think we need. But I agree. There needs clarification of why the position. change in title. Right. Does yeah. it mean anything, or is it just a? Can Carla? you explain the oh, line twenty? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Carla. <laughs> sorry, Carla. Why is uh, line twenty-four highlighted? It was a change, I think, from what we saw on the first sheet that was in our packet. That's actually what my question was. Line 23 and line 24 look to be the same thing. The first one you got people. did not show. Um, it, it looked like two people were doing one position. Yeah. It's two positions. It was clarified. We didn't have the information. We sent it out. But it's both 7th and 8th grade cross country. There are two So that's positions. two people. Right. So it's boys seventh and eighth grade and girls seventh and eighth grade. It's a mix. It's a mix. I think it's but, a mix. Remember too, with, with the cross country, that's one of those sports that our sixth graders can participate in, and run after the pack. Mm -hmm. And probably the wording would be better, but the word that comes to my mind is we do have a. I've already thought of a better way to say it. Um, we do have a large number of sixth graders who come out, and so that's why we felt through the budget process this year we needed to um, put that coaching position in. So it is seventh and eighth grade on interscholastic sports, but sixth graders do participate. Those positions were approved by the athletic people. Well, I just wondered were, why it was yeah. highlighted specifically. It's because it, it was um, it was a mission of what the type of what the position was on the previous. change easy for you to see. The difference in fee, by the way, is the fact that coaches get paid for a different rate for experience. Oh, okay. It's not an equity issue. No. It looks like an equity issue, but it's not. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments, questions, discussion? All those in favor? 7 0. <clears throat> What, what they have shown you is the level that they are paid at, which is an, an addition to what he's previously given us. Yeah, I think that was a Yes, it was. Yes. The next item on the agenda is ratification of contracts. We have the bus drivers and custodians, food service employees, Cape Elizabeth Education, Educational Administrators Association, and Cape Elizabeth Education Associate, Association. Charlie? I move acceptance of the contracts for 95, 96 for the bus driver custodians, for the food service employees, for the Cape Elizabeth Education Administrators Association, and for the Cape Elizabeth Education Association. Second. Gail, second. Any discussion? Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second this, that. <laughs> this is a first. It is. In many years. It is. All those in favor? Can Seven. I vote? <laughs> <laughs> Seven zero. I just would like to announce that the next school building committee meeting is Thursday, June twenty second at seven o'clock in the second floor conference room. And we have set some meeting dates for the summer of the school board. I would like to mention that on Wednesday, June 21st, the school board and the administrators are going to get together for an informal picnic. The school board, there will be a school board meeting on Tuesday, August 22nd. The school board will also have a meeting with administrators on Thursday, August 17th. And the school board will meet on their goals on July 6th. Hope I got all those dates right. Anne? And um, I did intend to try to get a policy date by tonight, and I did not do that. So we'll make sure we get that 
published in the Courier and in the Portland Press Herald as soon as one is set. Charlie, would there be a finance committee meeting before the August 26th? Yes, there will. Charlie? And one other meeting, um, the Movable Equipment Committee will be meeting at 3 p.m. on the 15th this Thursday in the offices of SMRT, I believe, to look at the bids for that went out for movable equipment. Any other business? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. <laughs> Is there a second? Second. All those in favor. Oh, I wanted to make one announcement what's, what's about the working? lacrosse. The, uh, oh, the, um, yes. At the town council meeting last night, there was a comment made that there will be girls lacrosse as a school sport next spring. And um, Connie, did you want to clarify that a little bit? Well, my understanding is that that is club status. Is that correct, Mr. Defusco? So, somebody said at the hearing that we it was a varsity sport. We currently have nine, nine girls participating in a club team in Portland called Back Bay, where our boys happen to beat on Sunday. We also have, I believe, 18 eighth graders, current eighth graders and girls coming to the high school. Where, where Keith is seeing that is, is that we currently have two assistants on, at the boys' program. What he would like to do, if the numbers are there, is to move one of those assistants from the boys' program to, the, to become the, the girls' coach on a club basis for the year. So it will, it will not be an increase in, in staffing as far as uh, coaching staff. It would be a lateral uh, transfer with the monies being there. This is something we've just talked about. He'll come to you obviously before that in August probably or before we start. But that's what his thinking is not to come to the board and say, we need another coach, we need more money, but he's looking for, for a, lateral, uh, a lateral move. Um, if the, and the numbers do seem to substantiate that. I have to tell you as principal to sign off, having students be dismissed at one o'clock so that they could play a playoff game in Portland and have to, we have kids tra being transported by parents who are in their own cars to get to a game to play for another club. I would rather have those kids playing for us under our supervision, under our coaching, uh, under our rules, so to speak, than, than play for, for another organization. But the interest is there, and you, you should know that. But uh, we will do it in, in a discreet and logical manner, I hope, in the fall. So it'll, it, I'm glad we'll you brought that up. We'll look forward to the yeah. proposal. So, okay. Thank right, you. Now, right. now we will adjourn.